Let me tell you that it's a joy to be here today in the Lord's house, and it's a joy for me to introduce to you uh, Dr. Hans Hilp Dilbeck, uh, Dr. Dilbeck, uh, or he probably might prefer to be called Hans, uh, Brother Hans, but uh, he's one of those guys that, uh, you know, I have watched from afar for a long time and uh, uh, watched how God has used him and how God has worked in his life. Uh, I didn't know till he came this morning that he used to serve as the youth director at First Baptist Church in Shawnee while he was at OBU many years ago. And uh, so he uh, spent some time in Shawnee, around Shawnee, and, uh, and uh, probably grew to love it like we all do. Uh, and uh, anyway, he, he's a two-time graduate of Southwestern Seminary. Him and I actually graduated the, the same year, 2002, him with his doctorate. And, me with my masters, but uh, uh, he's, he spent some time down in Fort Worth and uh, studying down there. And uh, he's got a wife and kids, and, and he loves the Lord. He's a former pastor at uh, Quail Springs Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. Uh, he moved from that position to become the executive director of the ba Oklahoma Baptist. Uh, and that job, he oversees what's going on with about 1,800 churches in Oklahoma, and uh, he's constantly traveling, going, meeting with churches, talking with pastors, and uh, you know, it, it's just a, it's a lot of responsibility, and, and I know that he needs God's help, as we all do, to do what God's called us to do. Uh, this morning, he comes to us as a preacher of the Word of God, I know from hearing him preach in the past, I know he loves the Word of God, I know he loves the people of God, and I know that he covets your prayers as he serves the Lord in, in the capacity that God's called him to. So I'm going to ask you all to join me as we pray together for our service today and pray for Brother Hans especially, that God would use him to speak to our hearts. Join me. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here today. We thank you for the privilege it is to come and worship you and be in your house together with your people. And Lord, we just ask your blessings upon what happens here this morning as Brother Hans comes and preaches to us from your throne. God, we pray that our hearts would be open and receptive and that the Holy Spirit would communicate the truth that you have for us today, Lord, so that we can take it and apply it and go and live it out in the world around us. Father, we, we know the world is desperately in need of what you have, and that is truth, your truth, real truth. And Father, we pray this morning that you would just anoint Brother Hans with your Holy Spirit, give him boldness, give him a Holy Spirit power to preach and to be effective in communicating the gospel to us. God, we love you and thank you for all you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Just, we're going to have special music. I'm going to share a song this morning that we've all sang so many times through the years. So just sing along with me and worship together. How great is our God? The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice.
great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will sing how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will sing how great, how great is our God. Thank you. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. I want to preach to you from a few verses of Scripture right at the beginning of Mark's Gospel this morning. Before I do, let me say thank you to Brother Mike for inviting me. It's good to have a pri privilege of being here with you this morning. And thank you for showing up. It would have been lonely without you. And You know, this is, a, this is an unusual season for our churches. Most of our churches are gathering up about 40 or for 50 percent of their of their normal normal group and we all know the reasons why and I appreciate your faithfulness to be here. Uh, I was born and raised in Pawhuska, Oklahoma, a town about like Prague probably and and uh, grew up in the First Baptist Church there and was saved when I was a kid and uh, God called me to preach just as I finished high school and I went to OBU, met and married my wife there. We, we got married. In fact, we had our first baby before we, we finished OBU. Our oldest son was born in Shawnee. And, and uh, we've got three grown sons that are married. We've got seven grandkids and one on the way. And uh, in fact, we had them all at the house last night. And the oldest granddaughter, six. And she was talking to my youngest daughter-in-law who's expecting a baby. And six-year-old Pearl just had just found that out. She's fascinated by by the fact that her aunt's having a baby and as we were eating I heard Pearl say to her aunt Carly she said are you uh, are you hungry and Carly said yes and then she said well who do you think's hungry are you or that baby in your belly <laughs> she's trying to figure that out uh, God's blessed us with our family and and uh, I, I served as a pastor in Oklahoma for 30 years in, uh, in, in the last half of that in Oklahoma City at Quell Springs Baptist Church, and had been in this role for about three years. Way back in 1883, it's a long time ago, 1883, uh, well before statehood, there were a few Baptist churches in the eastern part of the state in, in Indian Territory, and uh, they realized that most of what God has called the local church to do, she can do on her own under the Lordship of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. But they said, you know, there are a few things that we might could do better if we would cooperate with one another. And so they got together June 1st in Tahlequah, 1883, and formed the uh, Baptist Missionary and Educational Convention of Indian Territory. We, we've never been real good at names, really. <laughs> and uh, and in, their, in their founding documents, they said, we, we need to train leaders to strengthen our feeble churches so that we can get the gospel to the destitute people in our territory. It's very biblical wisdom and, and, and thoughtfulness on their part. Think about, think about the progression there. The end goal is to get the gospel to people who are destitute, who need the gospel. If we're going to do that, well, we've got to have strong and healthy churches, not sick and weak churches, feeble churches. We've got to strengthen our feeble churches. Well, what's the key to strengthening our feeble churches? We've got to train leaders. And the truth is that all these years later, that's a lot of what we do in our cooperative work. We train leaders. We strengthen the weak churches. When a church is strong and healthy, she doesn't need us for much. But we strengthen the weak churches so that we can advance the gospel to our territory and around the nation. And uh, you might not know this, but I know that your church is very faithful in your cooperative program giving. And I appreciate that. It, uh, you're, you're a leader in that regard. 
uh, you give a, a strong percentage of your of your general offerings to our cooperative work and about half of that money we send to the International Mission Board and the North American Mission Board and to our seminaries so we can get the gospel around the nation. You know, there are about 200 Oklahomans serving with the International Mission Board right now, literally all around the world supported by you. Many of them in places so dangerous I can't tell you where they are. But they're taking the gospel there and you're supporting them. And in the money we keep here, we spend more than half of that on the next generation trying to produce missionaries, children's ministry, students' ministry, collegiate ministry, and even what we prayed for today was a young man that's helping us on the University of Oklahoma campus. And uh, so I appreciate your faithfulness. And, and one other thing, and I'll stop talking about this, but over half of our churches don't have a full-time pastor. You might not realize this, but your church is easily in the top 15 or 20 percent churches as far as size in Oklahoma. When, when Brother Mike says 1,800 churches, he's right. There are only about 12 of them that gather 1,000 people. There are only about 50 that gather 500 or better. And only about 10 percent of our churches gather more than 115 or 20 people. Most of our churches are small. It's the way it's always been. That's the way it is all over the world in the kingdom of God. And, and so don't underestimate the significance of who you are and what you do week in and week out in, at Mammoth Baptist Church. This is the kingdom of God. This is how it works. And, uh, and I appreciate your faithfulness. Just yesterday I presided over a graduation ceremony for our school that we, we trained we, we train uh, men who don't have a college edu education. Many of them don't have a high school uh, diploma, but God's called them to preach, and we give them some basic training. It's called the Haskin School. And uh, I presided over the graduation yesterday afternoon. Eight, eight men graduated. Three of them were, were Anglo men, pastoring our churches bivocationally. Two of them were Hispanic men, barely spoke English, they pastor churches in the panhandle of Oklahoma. Two of them were Native American pastors. And one was a Persian pastor, Iranian man, who started a church in Oklahoma City reaching uh, Iranian immigrants in, in Oklahoma City with the gospel. And uh, I appreciate your partnership in, in our work here in Oklahoma. What a complicated year. I'll tell you what. I'm ready to get 2020 in the books. Uh, for churches, for businesses, for schools, even for football teams, it's confusing this year, isn't it? Uh, everybody's trying to make decisions without data, right? Trying to set a direction, but nobody knows what's coming. And my, my brother's a school administrator in a big 6A school here in Oklahoma City, and he sent me a video of a high school superintendent making decisions. And it's, it's a homemade video shot of this guy and that people were calling in asking questions, you know, like, like uh, are we going to have class live and are we going to have to wear a mask and is the state going to pay for the extra expenses? And he was given the questions and, and suddenly the, the video shot kind of widened out, and they realized he had one of those old magic eight balls in his hands. He was shaking it. <laughs> he said, no, not likely, or ask again later. <laughs> that's, uh, that's how complicated and confusing this year is. But well, here's a principle of life. Complexity calls us back to the basics. Isn't that true? The more complicated the situation, the more carefully we ought to focus on the fundamentals, on the basics. That's, that's true in business. It's true when you're driving. What do, what do you do when a storm starts? You get that 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and you pay attention, right? It's true on the battlefield. It's true in sports. I think about it as football season starting. When I started seventh grade football, I was so excited. I thought the first day of practice I was going to 
catch a touchdown pass or do something great on the field. And we spent the whole first day working on our stance. How wide apart are your feet and where do you put your hand on the ground? Because the basics are the things that will sustain you when the pressure comes. Well, when we move into the second half of 2020, which probably isn't going to be much better than the first half, then I, I think it's good for us to focus on some unchanging, always essential kingdom basics. What does Jesus want you and me to be about in the midst of this crazy year? I don't know much, but I know this. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. One of the most important paragraphs in the New Testament. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. Now after John had been taken into custody. Pause right there before we go on. Now after John had been taken into custody. That reminds us that Jesus brings the kingdom. Jesus starts his ministry right in the face of of a very troubling time. Dark days. Disappointment. John was the greatest man ever born up until Christ. And you remember why he was taken into custody? Because he confronted Herod's sin. Don't you, don't you know that the people were disappointed? They were confused. They were disillusioned. John, John is taken into custody. Herod's one. You ought to be taken into custody. That's not right. It's confusing. And it's right in that season of brokenness and disappointment that Jesus decides to start. Jesus came into Galilee preaching, proclaiming, sharing the gospel of God, the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is is at hand. It's here. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets to follow Jesus to follow him. There are three commandments here. Repent, believe in the gospel, follow Jesus. And these are commandments that are certainly relevant to people in their conversion when they first become followers of Christ. But do you know that these are present tense verbs? They're Keep on repenting. Keep on following me. They're as relevant to you if you've been a Christian for 30 years as they are to the person who walks down this aisle to give their life to Christ the first day. Christians are people who are repenting, who are believing in the gospel, and who are following Jesus. I, 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 you guys... Well, I know you don't know this, but way back in March when this virus was first starting, I got it. And uh, so I'm, I guess I'm kind of the key to the future. I'm immune. I can, and I gave it to my wife. We both had it. And, of course, we were worried about it, you know, and we've got a good friend that's a doctor. And you, you know what I had to do when I had COVID-19? I had to drink a lot of fluid, rest as much as I could. And take Tylenol. That's pretty basic, isn't it? A complex, confusing disease, pretty basic treatment. Now listen, there's a lot of things about 2020 I don't understand. I can't anticipate. But let me tell you what we know. If you're a Christian, you ought to be repenting, Believing in the gospel of God 
and following Jesus. Uh, let's just take those one at a time. Repentance. It, it, we, we know that repentance is the first movement toward Jesus. Like the prodigal son who comes to himself, who comes to his senses and says, what am I doing here? I need to go back to the Father. That change of mind, change of direction, change of life. One of the first things that happens to us when we get saved is we become aware of the brokenness, the sinfulness, the wastedness of our life. We turn our hearts and minds toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We're sorry for our sins and we want to change direction. Repentance. But as I mentioned, when the Bible even here says repent and believe in the gospel, it's using a present tense verb in the language of the New Testament that, 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 that uh, speaks to a continuing action. Keep on repenting, keep on repenting, keep on repenting. And, and, and Jesus says that a different way when He says in the Beatitudes, that blessed are the poor in spirit. Right? Blessed are those who mourn and who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those people who live with a holy dissatisfaction with who they are and how they're living. With a fresh and deep daily awareness of the fact that I need the grace of God in my life, His forgiveness. I don't measure up. Keep on repenting. Remember Jesus liked to tell a story about two people that went, two men that went to the temple to pray. And one of them stood up tall with his head raised and said, God, I thank you that I'm as good as I am. I thank you that I tithe on everything I get and I come to the temple and pray and I'm such a, I'm even a Baptist deacon, he said. Well, Jesus didn't tell it that way, but and the other man wouldn't even lift up his head. Instead, he beat his chest. And he said, oh, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. And Jesus said, it's that man who went down to his house justified that day. As an individual... Ask yourself the question, is my life, is my life marked by repentance? As a church, ask yourself this question, is our life marked by repentance? You see, we live in a day in which individuals are so constantly aware and critical of what's wrong with everybody else around them. And we live in a day in which Christians are so constantly and critically aware of what's wrong with the culture. But it seems like we have lost the capacity of being critical of ourselves. And our Lord Jesus teaches us that the essential to moral and spiritual influence is to be more critical of yourself than you are of other people. Because as soon as your neighbor or this nation catches a whiff of self-righteousness, they dismiss us. And so they should. Jesus says, you spend so much time trying to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Remember that? But it's like you can't even see this big old plank in your own eye. And so, listen, until you, until you take this step, you, you don't have anywhere else to go. Are you repenting? Because I'm not sure all that God wants to do in our churches and in your life in the midst of this season of uncertainty, but I am sure that He's still on His throne and He does have a purpose. And I know that one key, maybe even the first key, to realizing His purpose for us in this season is to live 
with a heart and a life of repentance. Oh God, search me. Show me my heart. Show me any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Not, God, would you judge the other political party or God, would you straighten out my neighbor or God, would you get Hollywood and Washington, D.C. straight? How about first, would you search me? Would you bring renewal to our church? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance, then I'll heal their land. So if the land is sick, it's not because lost people are acting like lost people. It's because the Christians aren't acting like Christians. And the first and essential characteristic of a Christ follower is someone who lives daily with repentance. Humble, broken, poor in spirit, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Repent. But Brother Mike told me you guys could take it straight. Amen. All right? Let's, let's start right there. I, of course, we could spend a lot more time with that, but I'm going to move on. Believe in the gospel. You know the word gospel. Jesus came preaching the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Believe in the gospel. That's an Old Testament word that Jesus picks up and emphasizes in the New Testament. It means good news. It means the proclamation, the declaration of good news. When Jesus says the time is fulfilled, He's saying God is keeping His promise now. He promised you good news, and in me it's here. And the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel, is the good news of His kingship, the good news of His rule, of His reign, that God is on His throne, and in the person of Jesus Christ, He's here to set the world right. And the way He sets the world right is He sets you right and He sets me right. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through His death on the cross, His new life risen from the grave, His reign at the right hand of God, He is bringing the good news of Jesus Christ that He can set us right. He hadn't abandoned us. He hadn't abandoned this broken world. He's intervened on our behalf to bring about redemption of all creation and of you and of me. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Believe in the gospel. Listen, that, that's an imperative for somebody who needs to get saved. If you're here this morning and you never had a life-changing encounter with Christ, let me how you, here's how you do it. Jesus tells us, repent of your sin and believe in the gospel. But this is also an imperative for every one of us who's been following Christ for years. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means that every day of my life I'm repenting. And it means that every day of my life, every breath I breathe, I am living with confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe at the depths of my being that Jesus is who He claimed to be. He did what He said He would do. He's on the throne. He's a living, He's alive and at work. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Right? And that the gospel has the power to set people right. Can I tell you what I think might be the number one problem in our churches today? We have lost our gospel confidence. I mean, we sit home and we, 
We watch Fox News and we wring our hands and we get frustrated and fearful. We think, oh no, this world's going to hell in a handbasket and our community's not what it used to be and all these families are fracturing. Woe is me. We can't do anything about it. What do we have to offer this old broken world? We act like we don't have anything to offer this old broken world. You know why we act that way? Deep down, that's what we believe. But as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, my core conviction ought to be that the good news of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can make a difference in this old broken world. So, what do we do in a season like this? We repent of our sin and we believe again the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, right now, because of COVID worldwide, there's an unusual number of International Mission Board missionaries that are home. They can't get back into their country. And one of them grew up in our church in Quell Springs, and I knew that he, he was from North Africa. He's in Oklahoma City now. I also knew, no, that there are 600 North African refugees who live and work in the meatpacking plants in Guyman, Oklahoma. So, some of them are from Eritrea. I, I don't, don't be impressed. I had to look it up. I didn't even know there was such a country. Little bitty country on the Horn of Africa. We can't send a missionary there. Right? But we have this missionary who lives in Ethiopia and he sneaks in and out. So, I called my friend and I said, listen, do we have anybody who can speak to these Eritreans in, in Gaima? He said, well, maybe. I don't, know if he's, I don't know if he's stateside or not. Let me check. Two days later, he called me and said, yeah, he's in Alabama. I said, tell him Oklahoma Baptist will fly him to Oklahoma City if he'll drive four hours out to Gaiman and try to talk to these people. So he did. And these two missionaries, one from North Africa, a different country, one from, one from Oklahoma, one from Alabama, they went to Guyman, they got with a pastor, First Baptist Guyman, and they went door to door in this apartment complex where all these North Africans lived, knocked on doors. When those Eritreans heard that old white guy speak their language, they just stepped backwards. They said, how do you know, how do you know our language? And one of them got on his knees and asked Jesus Christ to be his Savior and Lord. God brought those people from the Horn of Africa to Gaiman and brought a missionary who learns their language from Alabama to Gaiman to get them the gospel, and it changed his life. But we won't walk across the street and share the gospel. Do, do, you, remember the, do you remember the Apostle Paul said, I can't wait to get to Rome. This is Romans chapter 1. He said, I can't wait to get to Rome. Rome's a big city. Rome is like Washington, D.C. and Wall Street and Hollywood all wrapped into one. All the worst, everything that's bad about the world is in Rome. Paul says, I can't wait to get to Rome. Do you remember, do you remember what he said? He said, because when I get there, I'm going to preach the gospel to them. Paul says, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, And the gospel has never once disappointed me. That, that's what Paul means when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. He's not saying I'm not embarrassed of the gospel. He said, it never lets me down. The gospel has never not once disappointed me, Paul says, because... It is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. That was Paul's core conviction. And one of the reasons why we flounder in our nation today as a church is because we just don't seem to believe that anymore. 
It's the power of God unto salvation. One of the things maybe you need to repent of is, Oh, God, forgive me because I've lost my confidence in the gospel. I live like I've got nothing to say, nothing to offer. Number three, follow Jesus. Listen, I, there, there are a lot of things about 220 that baffle and confuse me, but I know a man. I know a man who has mastered all the complexities of our day and knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. His name is Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus says, If you want to serve me, you've got to follow me. Isn't that interesting? And, and it's such, I mean, it's, it's like, duh. But isn't that the mistake we so often make? Trying to serve Jesus without following Jesus? And just as repent and believe are commandments that not only apply to our conversion, but to our lifelong commitment, so also is follow Jesus. Christians are people who are following Jesus, following Jesus, following Jesus. If I asked your neighbor, hey, is old Joe, is, is he a Christian? He would say, oh yeah, he's a Baptist, he goes down to... But if I said, is old Joe a follower of Jesus Christ? You think he might hesitate? Follow me, live like I live. That leaves more than, listen, it means more than that, doesn't it? Follow me is not just live like I live, follow my rules. When Jesus says, follow me, follow me, he's reminding us that he is our living Lord. Listen, from the first century, the great Christian confession of faith has been a simple three-word confession. Jesus is Lord. And every one of those three words is weighty. Jesus, Lord, is. You see, the distinctive of our faith is that we don't just confess Jesus was Lord, is. He's the living Lord and Savior. So we can follow Him, not just His rules, we can follow Him. And so that takes the pressure off, doesn't it? It sets us free. To say, oh, I'm not sure what tomorrow holds, but I'm following Jesus. I think He's got it figured out. I'm not sure where this is going, but I'm following Jesus. He knows. I was taking my, we, we had our older three grandkids, a six-year-old girl and two three-year-old boys, cousins, and they spend the night with us. And we had some kind of some kind of woods not far from our house. And, and, uh, I've learned already with those grandkids just to run them hard and keep them up past their bedtime and then I can get a good night's sleep. So it's, it was getting dark and I said, okay, we're going to go on a walk. And I set them down there on the fireplace, three, two, three-year-old boy, and I said, we're going to, and here's, here's what we're going to, we're going to go up to the end of the block and we've got these flashlights, we're going to turn them on and we're going to turn down this trail. And we're going to follow the trail. We're going to see a big pond. I was kind of pond, and I was telling them all about the walk. And there was a six-year-old girl, you know, she was just clued in. And her eyes were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And these three-year-old boys weren't paying any attention at all. And finally she said, well, how will we know to come back home? And I said, well, I, I'll tell you it's time. She said, oh, you're going with us. <laughs> She just relaxed. She thought she, would, she thought she was on her own. Remember Jesus said, 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And don't forget, I am with you always. We're following Him. We're following Him. That's all you have to do as a church. I, I know Brother Mike, I know Brother Mike is retiring soon. You know, he's not the chief shepherd of the church, he's the under shepherd. Jesus is the chief shepherd, the head of the body. You follow Him as a church and as an individual to follow Jesus. So listen, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, I know what God's will for you is this year. To be repenting of your sin. Not everybody else's, yours. To be believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ as the power of God for salvation for your neighbor and the nations. And to follow Jesus with every day, with every breath. You do that, and He'll be honored in your life. It could be that you're here this morning, and you've never had a life-changing encounter with Christ. You still feel the weight and the burden of your sins. You don't know for sure that you'd go to heaven if you died right now. You're lost. Let me tell you how to get saved. Repent of your sins. Believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And follow Jesus. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Father, I thank you for the simple truth and beauty, power of your word. We thank you that your word is living and active, sharp as a two-edged sword, as relevant today as it ever has been. We praise you, Lord Jesus, seated on the throne, because you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our living Savior. You walk with us, and we follow you. And Father, we as your people, we do repent. Forgive us for being critical of others, for trying to take the speck out of everybody else's eye, not being poor in spirit, repenting of our own sin, sinful thoughts and sinful words or relationships and deeds. Oh God, search our hearts. Forgive us for our lack of confidence in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Burn in us once again a zeal, a passion that comes from a confidence that Jesus is mighty to save. And give us grace day by day, starting even this afternoon, to follow Jesus. Every prompting, every prompting, step by step to follow Jesus to the praise and the glory of His grace. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning who's never been saved, that the day they would come repenting of sin and trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ with a full-hearted commitment to follow Jesus all their days. I pray that today could be a day of salvation for some. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Brother Mike is here. We'll have an invitation time.
ีฟี